Hello everyone and welcome to this month's Mental Health for All webinar. I'm Babita Sharma, broadcaster, author and journalist and also proud trustee of United for Global Mental Health. Now today we're going to be reflecting on the successes of this year's World Mental Health Day and discussing how we can all get involved in new initiatives that have been launched this month. And we're also really thrilled to have an exciting panel discussion for you where we're going to be making sure that uh, you get the chance to join in on the conversation as well. And please do let us know who you are, your name and where you're um, contacting us from today via the chat function so we can make this as interactive as possible. Now, this month, we have a wonderful panel that will be telling us about the important work that they've been doing to make mental health and well-being a global priority. And before we get started, I'd like to introduce our guests who are going to share a brief introduction of what they are up to. So with us, and um, I think we can see them with their cameras on, we have Charlene Zunkel, who is the CEO of Global Mental Health Peer Network, joining us from South Africa today. Give us a little wave, Charlene. Hello, great to see you. And we also have Kevin Martinez, who is the Vice President of Corporate Citizenship at ESPN, joining us from Brussels today. Hi, Kevin. And uh, Nicole Bardikoff, who's the Associate Director for Global Mental Health from Toronto today. Hi, Nicole. And we might be expecting um, Don Zane, um, possible a couple of difficulties, um, technical ones, joining us from Awesome Mind Speaks. Um, Don is the founder there, so as soon as he turns up, we'll bring him in. Um, but in the meantime, we will um, start our session today. And just a big thank you, by the way, for being here today to enjoy this conversation and also find out more about what everybody is up to. So, Charlene, can I start with you? Um, huge congratulations, by the way, on the launch of the Lancet Commission report on mental health stigma and discrimination. Everyone is talking about it. I know it's been a real huge body of work that's been incredibly time consuming. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about how the launch went and some of the priorities and the next step for the uh, Lancet Commission, please. Oh, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think uh, this year's World Mental Health Day really went off with a huge bang, uh, especially with my involvement with the Lancet Commission on Ending Stigma and Discrimination in Mental Health. The launch were happened right on, on the day of World Mental Health Day, and it was really well received worldwide. Uh, I think especially by the media, uh, and that includes like the print broadcast, but also across social media, that really reached uh, a large uh, audiences beyond the mental health sector. And that, of course, is also thanks to uh, the team, the communications team at United for Global Mental Health and BB Partners, who really pushed the word out there uh, to promote the commission. I think local stakeholders and global stakeholders also seem to have valued the specific focus on stigma and discrimination. As we all know, this is uh, an all too familiar barrier that has prevented people with lived experience from really thriving despite their mental health condition. Uh, I think people with lived experience themselves, where I have been communicated with, really welcome the report and appreciate uh, the efforts to set this ambitious call to end stigma uh, and also having the specific emphasis on placing lived experience central to anti-stigma initiatives. Uh, with a report uh, that reaffirms that we do know what to do and how to do it to tackle stigma and discrimination. So going forward, the Commission's recommendations, which are targeted at various uh, stakeholders, and that includes uh, international agencies such as WHO, governments, uh, policymakers, uh, health practitioners, employers, and of course, specifically also the media, who plays a very important role, but also communities and uh, people with lived experience themselves. Uh, alongside the recommendations, there are indicators, so that in itself is going to help to measure progress. Um, and this, I think, will definitely drive the aspirations of the Commission going forward. Um, in particular, uh, the impacts and the progress that will be measured uh, will come from people with lived experience or people with mental health conditions over time. Uh, and this will allow us to really see how uh, actual experiences at grassroots level 
relate to the realization of the uh, report recommendations in terms of law and policy changes, uh, anti-stigma programs and supporting people with lived experience to lead or co-lead uh, anti-stigma initiatives, but also at levels of workplaces, places of education, uh, attitudes of uh, professionals, health professionals, and in media reporting, of course. So in a nutshell, I do believe that all these activities going forward and, and the recommendations and everybody collectively working towards implementing these will keep this uh, commission alive. Thank you. I hope so too. And I, can I just add, be before we move on to our other panelists, um, you know, an incredible amount of work has gone into this. And obviously the motivation to really pinpoint solutions-based offerings, if you like, to a, a subject that has, for, for many people, never really delved that deep into this issue. And, and here we are doing that. What is your hope for it, for where it lands, Charlene, in the next few months and years? Because as we know, it takes a, a while, doesn't it, to really penetrate into the people that need to know about it most? Yeah, I think if we work all together, we can definitely make a difference. I think it's not, I think what, what's crazy about the, the recommendation that it's got different target audiences. Mm. Um, and I think that again speaks of the issue around, it's not only people in the mental health sector that needs to address or work towards eliminating stigma, but it's everybody's business. And I do hope that, you know, in years to come, that there will no more be discrimination when people with lived experience want to apply for employment, want to go study and further their uh, education, um, that they receive dignified services within the health sector. Uh, and also, of course, that uh, media reporting becomes more sensitized to the impact it can cause if you report in you know, a negative or incorrect or inaccurate way. So I think there's uh, changes that I hope to see on multiple levels, uh, especially community level as well. And I think the most uh, important is the recognition of uh, people with lived experience themselves playing a part in of this. Yeah, and also the language that we use around it as well. I think that's really important to make sure that we are clear and compassionate in our understanding of the subject as well. It's, it's just congratulations. You know, it's great to have that out there. And I'm sure we're going to talk about that a bit more in detail. But um, Kevin, if I can, welcome. Um, I just really want to know what you're up to. And thanks for joining us, by the way, for this session. And, you know, the Chosen Kindness Project campaign. Tell us more about that and how others can support it and what you've been working on since World Mental Health Day. Well, thank you, Babita. So first of all, I just want to thank everybody. I am new to this space and I cannot tell you how amazing it is to network and to hear people and to give us guidance. And so um, briefly, we are a sports broadcasting company that's owned by the Walt Disney Company that also has many television networks across the, 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 the US. Um, and we had a program that was an anti-bullying initiative because we wanted to make sure that sports had an ability to change the world. And we knew a lot of bullying happened in the locker room and in, in stadiums. And so we felt it was our social responsibility to help kids and parents and adults to find the right medium on how to deal with that. But as you know, with the social injustice in the United States and other major issues in the pandemic, we saw a major outflow of other issues. And so our chairman asked us to rethink the program. It was called Shred Hate, Choose Kindness. And so what we did is we created a program called the Choose Kindness Project. And the reason we, we did that was as we also knew we were not an authority. So we also were working with a couple of nonprofit organizations and we said, listen, we, we, we know that this is much bigger than just bowling prevention. Um, it's about inclusion, it's about racism and bias. And so how do we really kind of narrow that in? And we came up with the term intentional inclusion, which is how do you proactively engage people? Uh, the other piece to this was, is we knew that the outcome was mental wellness. How could we get youth and parents to get to a safe place to not self-harm or be harmed? And so um, a sports organization and, and ABC, which is the American Broadcasting Company, came together. Um, we have now 22 nonprofits uh, that we have brought on board as the Choose Kindness Alliance. 
they're advising us and counseling us on the um, specific investments that we will make. Our investment most specifically is on content. Where can we tell the better story? And you know what Charlene was saying, and I just so love it, which is making sure we have the right words, right? Making sure that there's the ability to develop this across our platform. So one of our investments is we'll be doing media guides for all of our television networks to make sure, and that's, um, that's developed by organizations using the right words. We're also doing something very unique to us first time is that we're doing intersectionality. So we have organizations that are authorities in the space of mental wellness. We have academic institutions, Harvard University is one of them. We have organizations that are uh, focused in on race um, and identity, uh, sexual identity. And so our hope is, is that we can build pr programs that allow people to come in as it looks to intersectionality, my example is an African-American or black man comes in, self-identifies as gay, but is dealing with issues of cyberbullying. How can we help or how can this alliance help? So it's aspirational right now, but I'm excited to say that we just um, put our first grants out. Uh, it's about a million and a quarter uh, dollars to organizations in three different areas. The first are desert grants to come on board to say, we, we understand that you need to grow in capacity. So they're capacity building grants. The second are collaboration grants, which is that intersectionality. How can we make sure that race and sexual identity are dealt with accordingly with thought leaders? So it's not separate. It's not, you don't have to leave the room to go to another entity, right? And the third is innovation. If we're looking five years in advance, these organizations, these thought leaders are saying, here's what we need to do. Our goal is to try to invest in that, to bring it forward so it's less than five years so that we can really develop some sort of assets that will you know, really build um, momentum for everyone to be in the room. Um, the other piece of it is, is that you know, if, if we're gonna do this correctly, we have to be really careful as a media organization. It's not our content but we have to share the content accordingly and let people opt into the content. So we'll be doing PSAs. I'm excited to say when we launched um, on World Mental Health Day, we had 10 minutes on an NBA show, the National Basketball Association on ESPN, which is unheard of. You cannot That's kind of like half-time Super Bowl kind of territory. <laughs> it is. And we had Kevin Love, who is a, a basketball player, uh, very well known for mental wellness, did an extraordinarily good job. And then our goal is across, whether it's the Walt Disney Company, Disney Junior, uh, the different shows that we have is to make sure that the mental wellness piece, the intentional inclusion and bullying prevention are in there. And of course, we're looking for partners as we move forward so that we can make sure that we're hitting the right messaging the right way. Um, right now we're launching in North America and our hope is to move to Europe next year and really focus on probably digital wellness will be one of our major platforms. Wow. That's a lot. That is a lot of information. That is a lot of ambitious goals there. And I know you've said, you know, we're, you're starting and that's the motivation again for you is that you're getting going. And I think that's really something to be said for in this space. You mentioned about media guides. I was just interested, Kevin, are we talking about media guides for the end user or are we talking about media guides for the facilitators of content? Oh, I've just, oh, if you could take your mic, if you could put your mic live, that'd be great. Oh, it's gone off again, I think. Lovely, I think we've got, there yeah, we wonderful. So um, for both. So the goal is, is that we're helping those with toolkits that are nonprofits. So we're investing for nonprofits and for stakeholders, but specifically academic institutions for media organizations. And so we're working with UCLA and Harvard and others to be able to make sure that when we talk about what cyberbullying means to us, what it means to uh, intersectionality for young people, for parents, et cetera. So the goal is, is to provide those resources. And we've done small bits and pieces with that, particularly with the um, LGBTQIA community, but this is gonna be a broader uh, um, asset. And, and for you personally in this role and, you know, in, in command, if I can say, of this huge portfolio of work to come, um, what's your inspirational theme here, you know, for you when you think about where we are in the conversation of mental health to where we were perhaps five or 10 years ago? You know, it's, it's uh, you know, I lead the ship for sports. And so what I'm trying to do is to make sure that sports, we use the power of sports for social good and we treat it as we would with any other celebrity or media, et cetera. So 
what 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 it, what gives me hope and what gives me power every day is that we work with the American leagues and each of those organizations now have a mental wellness um, program or an authority that they're working on. So we know it's valuable, but I, I would say what gives me the greatest sense of hope and completion is about uh, seven years ago when we launched Shred Hate um, was an anti-bullying initiative. We worked with an organization called Crisis Text. And the goal was is to make sure that we were getting young people before they self-harmed. And Crisis Text gave us some information that basically said, we helped five to six young people not self-harm. For me, that is the greatest thing in the world that we could do. So yeah. I'm really excited about it. Yeah, we are too. Thank you for sharing that with us, Kevin. We're gonna come back to you in a moment, but this is a great um, moment actually to bring in more about the youth mental health, which is a space, a huge focus of area for many working in the mental health space. And Nicole, uh, over to you, because you can tell us a bit more about the new youth focused mental health initiative that's called Being. It has launched today, I understand. Um, before I let you answer, uh, which I will do, just a reminder to everybody joining us, welcome to you. Thank you so much for being on this Mental Health for All webinar. Um, just a reminder, to please to make this as interactive as possible. We'd love to get your questions. There'll be an opportunity for you to put them to the panelists. Well, I will do that for you if that's okay. Um, just um, submit your questions via the Q&A function at the bottom of your tab. But yes, Nicole, sorry, yes, to the incredible initiative about being, tell us about that and it launches today and um, how things are moving. Thank you, thank you, Papita, and thank you um, everyone for joining, and thank you for having me as part of this uh, this group. It's great to be able to speak and hear more about these exciting new um, these these new initiatives within the mental health space. So yes, we are. Um, so I'm host at Grand Challenges Canada. For anyone who doesn't know us, we're one of the largest impact first investors in Canada. We support innovators who are closest to some of the most pressing challenges in the world. And over the last 12 years, we have uh, funded over 1,400 innovations um, championed by innovators in over 95 countries. And we've been funding in the mental health space for about 10 years. And what we do there is we support innovative solutions that meet people where they are. So be that integrating mental health into primary care, into schools, within peer groups, leveraging digital tools, and really within the past few years, focusing very much on young people um, and supporting youth-led solutions. And we're really excited that we can say today, we can announce here today that we are launching the next phase of this work, a new initiative called Being which is a global collaboration. It will be hosted at Grand Challenges Canada, but it's in partnership with United for Global Mental Health, with Fondation Botner, Global Affairs Canada, as well as others. And our goal is to support the mental health and well-being um, of young people in low resource settings. So we know that there's an, a real an, an urgent need to, um, to shift from individually focused and medicalized approaches to youth-informed approaches that, that are looking to create enabling environments across sectors and supportive communities that really cater to the needs of young people. And that's why through this initiative, we're going to be taking um, an approach really looking to address, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the personal, societal, environmental, as well as other drivers that impact the mental well-being of young people ages 10 to 24 in low and middle income countries with the goal of creating positive lasting change in local communities as well as beyond. We're gonna be starting this initiative off in 13 priority countries. I'm going to name them all, but I don't expect anyone to remember them. You can get all of this information on the Grand Challenges website, but our 13 countries that we're starting off in are Colombia, Ecuador, Senegal, Sierra Leone, Ghana, Morocco, Tanzania, Egypt, Romania, India, Pakistan, Indonesia, and Vietnam. And a special focus there was an urban and peri-urban context. Well done for remembering them all, by the way. Oh, thank you. It's been a little bit of time, but I think I've got it. <laughs> <laughs> but we really, our goal here is that these, that by starting in these geographies, we can actually provide a blueprint for systems level change that can be then applied in different countries as well. So this initiative is starting off as a seven year initiative. And as I said, we're looking to bring this kind of systems level change in these target geographies um, through a strategic and coordinated approach that combines um, a number of different um, ways of working. And we're gonna be kind of bringing all this together. So we'll, this will be you know, networks, research, innovation, policy, advocacy, and really working with young people and people with lived experience in order to achieve our vision, which is a world where young people feel well and thrive. 
So we're going to be supporting both research and innovation through this initiative. Um, we're going to be looking at research to better understand the mental health ecosystem, to better understand the drivers of mental health and emerging stressors for young people, as well as the kind of local in-country, what are, what are barriers to scale, what are, what are needs, what work is already being done on the ground that we can support and build off of. And we're going to then use a lot of this knowledge um, to create what we will and, and inform what our funding will then look like when it comes to innovation and implementation. So we're going to be supporting both early stage innovations to test new solutions to um, addressing young people's mental health and well-being, as well as transitioning to scale promising tested mental health innovations um, using Grand Challenges Canada's transition to scale approach, which has been successful for us for the last, last decade. And as with our model, we provide support through both financial and non-financial means, and are really trying to work in this multi-stakeholder um, multi um, way to enable frameworks and, and policies and really work at both a local as well as a, a global level to advance the dialogue and support around young people's mental health. So just to say, we also, we actually have an open call out right now. Um, it's on our, the Grand Challenges website. It is for researchers, groups, organizations based in low and middle income countries to analyze some of this local information on young people's mental health and well-being, and really importantly, to lead stakeholder and network engagement to scope some of these opportunities for investment and for collaboration um, in these priority countries. And the findings and the engagements will this, from this will then help identify opportunities to catalyze change for young people's well-being. And I said, you can find out more on our website. We're going to have an information webinar next week. And this call right now is open until November 17th. So there's some time to take a look, think about if this is something that um, might be of interest to people on the call. And it's a really exciting opportunity to inform the work that we'll be doing in the next, uh, the next few years. So I've got that down to about two and a half weeks for that call out to be answered. Nicole, thank you yeah. very much for that. Um, and as Nicole was talking, um, our brilliant team at United for Global Mental Health um, have been posting links that you can read a little bit more about that in the chat function. So have a look. But you know, the timing of this initiative, um, Nicole, is really something. Um, thank you. Because I know since the pandemic, and for many people, the pandemic is ongoing. But um, mental health among young people has really kind of, and rightly so, been push to the forefront of this conversation. And I think with more initiatives like this, there has to be more of a hand-holding. And I do literally mean to hand-holding exercise for young people who are trying to navigate this crazy world right now. And I'm just wondering from your perspective, and you know, you mentioned that age group 10 to 24, that's a big age group. So how are we kind of drilling down into that in terms of specifics where, you know, you might be dealing with mental health with a teenager, yeah. mental health to a young adult, mental health to a child that's going through, you know, puberty or adolescence or, you know, where does that break up? Absolutely. It is a big, it's a big age group and it's an age group where there's a lot of different things going on. And that's in part why we focus on it because we know, you know, 75% of mental health challenges are going to start before the age of 24. So it's this really great um, opportunity to be able to provide support early on and provide um, um, support young people to be able to develop some of the skills that they might need later in life to be able to address mental health challenges that they experience. Uh, and, but it is, it's, it's going to be a varied need, and that's really what we're looking for for the next, um, for, for this initial scoping work, is we want to be able to respond to what's happening and what's needed in different country contexts. We don't want to come in and be incredibly prescriptive and say, this is what we're going to fund and this is what we think is needed. Instead, we're really looking to um, local actors to help inform us of that. And so what we fund in one country might look very different from what we fund in another, including around the age group, um, what we're looking at. So we really wanna be able to um, have the flexibility to respond to in-country needs. And that's why we've got this kind of broader mandate to start with that will then really drill down very specifically. But we do think that one of the exciting parts of this is um, really being able to focus on those early drivers. So really thinking about what are the needs for young people in these early, you know, early ages or early experiences. Yeah. Um, and be able to address those. 
And what's interesting talking to all three of you, thank you, Nicole, what's interesting talking to all three of you is that there is such an overlap, isn't there, on um, what we're talking about here and, and the initiatives and the goodwill and also, you know, young people as well. I mean, Kevin, you mentioned that and also Charlene, you did as well. We've got a lot of questions, as I knew we would, coming through. If it's OK with all three of you, I'd love to um, go through some of them um, and get a response from you all. Um, Judah has um, asked this question. Thank you for this. For the Lived Experience Council, how can we balance participation and get input? from all parts of the world, especially being in Africa and identifying as part of a minority, for example, the LGBTQIA community. How do you navigate that to capture these voices? Um, Kevin, do you want to address that? Well, I'm not sure that I can because I think it's above my pay grade, but what I will say is the, the, the basic structure of that question is what we're trying to build in the US because I think a lot of people think that this structure is already in the US and it is not. And so applying that standard of operating procedures, the best thing for us is, again, speaking as a media company, is having authorities that can speak, that are thought leaders, that have the, the data and also the populations that can be part of this. So for us, the LGBTQIA community is a number of organizations, the GLAD Media Organization, HRC, um, GLSEN, uh, Trevor Project, that are doing best practices here and listening to them and also not asking them to mission drift as we do this, which is the other thing is a lot of funders will ask you to mission drift. So our goal is to make sure that we're trying to also hit the KPIs of the organizations that we're partnering with. Yeah, and I also think whatever, um, how that works out, Kevin, in the US is also a really good opportunity to see what the module, what the model looks like in operation, that others perhaps being in Africa or other parts of the world will be able to look and see how that's gone, which I think is really important. Again, it's all about sharing, isn't it? Sharing that network, sharing those initiatives and seeing how that lands. Um, Charlene, it's an interesting one because we're talking a lot about lived experience. And I know that that is very much key to what we have been discussing when you talked about the Lancet report. So in answer to Judah's question, how are we, you know, really ensuring that we work to capture those voices that matter, particularly in those communities as highlighted by Judah, the LGBTQI community, but also geographically having that spread and also, you know, talking about what's happening on the ground for many people that might not be from Europe or America? Yes, yeah. I think it's important that we always include diverse voices, and that means LGBTQ communities, women, youth, everyone we cannot say that we are uh, represented globally if we do not include those voices uh, i know from the african continent um, i think we sometimes deal with our own issues or maybe a little bit more harsh stigma and discrimination especially in terms of lgbtq communities but also with mental health related because there's a lot of cultural um, issues uh, involved as well um, but I think from the Global Mental Health Peer Network, that's also what we believe in, in to bring those lived experience voices. And we do have uh, subcommittees, for example, one specifically on LGBTQ, just to make sure that those voices are also heard. Um, and I think if you really want to create something that works, whatever it is, even if you look at um, addressing stigma and discrimination, you cannot do it to without having those voices to contextualize, you know, like at local level, because contexts are different. What what US maybe needs or issues need to address stigma and discrimination or other issues is not going to be the same as it is in certain places of Africa. So everything is different. So you need those voices if you really want to make a difference. Yeah. And I think it's the nuances really, isn't it? Go ahead, Nicole. Oh, I hadn't, I hadn't unmuted, but I think I just to, to say that I completely agree. And it's um, part of what I think enables this type of work to be successful is to be responsive to what different communities and different contexts needs and not trying to apply a one size fits all model because that will never, it will never work. Um, and it's really exciting to hear from everyone today. And I think it's a, something that's coming up more and more within the mental health field is that type of approach, that recognition of these different um, 
the, the need to listen to different voices and different and from different areas. And also the taskmasters of mental health as well. When we look at policy, you know, who are they? Are they diverse themselves? I think that's really important to understand that you have got representation at every single level of whatever initiative, whatever an organization that you're working with in order that that then trickles down and has the right impact. Um, Nicole, question for you. Kelly's asking, um, oh, good news on the initiative. How might this relate to the WHO mental health initiative? Initiative, 12 countries that is perhaps grand challenges kind of focus on young people versus more general does that yeah yes yes absolutely so the WHO special initiative for mental health which is a really exciting initiative that's been going on for the last few years to be able to provide more mental health support um, in different priority geographies so yes um, we have not an we have one overlap in country where we'll be working um, of course wanting to work with everyone who's worked who's in that space including WHO with this is Ghana uh, the but but it's exactly what actually Kelly what you've identified which is the WHO work is really exciting and it's also looking at mental health more broadly across the lifespan which is really important our work is going to come in and really focus on young people as well as looking at early drivers around well-being so not just um, not not specifically focus on on providing treatment options, though that's really important. But also, how can we tackle this from a prevention and promotion space? So it's a little bit outside the remit of some of what the WHO will be doing. Um, but if anything, we just see it's really really um, important and um, helpful that we can be working strategically with others who are in working like the WHO um, in these different countries as well, because I think the way that we'll be successful all of us, not, not just being, though we're very excited about it, is to be strategically connecting to other um, actors and other work that's going on within the mental health ecosystem, the special initiative being a really great example of that. Um, thank you. And just to add to that, Nicole, a question from Valentina, any social media post on being um, that we could, that could be amplified? So is there a social media? Presence around. Yes, there is. I think that uh, United for Global Mental Health may have just put it in the chat. But yes, it is the Being Being Initiative, um, and all of that is coming out right now. So uh, oh yes, thank you. There is a Twitter link there. on there. Great Perfect. timing. <laughs> Great timing. Um, there is an interesting question here that's come in, um, and it's from Natalie, who's asking: Is anyone working on mental health initiatives in Afghanistan and Syria, for instance? There, there are wars ongoing here, and the people appear to be completely forgotten. Um, I'm going to add another country to that, which is UK, Ukraine, Natalie, if I can. And you know, I have to say, um, in my role as trustee for United for Global Mental Health, those people haven't been forgotten, and I know that there is a lot of work coming through and a goodwill to want to support, particularly young voices and young children that are caught up in the tragedy that is the war that's unfolding um, and has gone on and also in Sri Lanka and places like that. Um, I also know that sport has played a really instrumental um, tool for not just reconciliation but um, positivity for lots of young people in those countries. I mean, I'm just thinking about Afghanistan and Syria being involved in various different sporting tournaments, Kevin. I'm just wondering if you have a view on that and, and anything you'd like to share with us. I do. I, I just I just got off the phone with Qatar um, and the work that they're doing, uh, which is phenomenal, by the way, which um, they're building a legacy program that is going to help kids that includes mental wellness and mental health. And so that's the first thing I would say is that there is this ability to use sports as a platform to get into unique uh, communities, but also very strong communities that, you know, culturally are important to us. Um, I'm going to do a shout out very quickly to Grand uh, Challenge Canada, because I went to a meeting yesterday and I saw two of the most amazing uh, investments. Um, and one was Waves for Change and the other was Tina Geyser, which I believe is in the Ukraine. And I could not believe the value proposition of the youth that were doing it. So it's youth leading youth and really establishing and connecting to youth to ask them where the problems are and what those mean. I was blown away, not only just about the KPIs, but also setting a standard for best practices globally and looking at war and conflict and looking at economic and looking at access and entry. Uh, and there was even HIV AIDS as it relates to how to deal with some of this and stuff. So kudos to Grand Challenge for Canada for the work that they're doing there. And 
Go ahead, Nicole, because I know you probably want to share with some of the initiatives that are on the ground in some of those places that we've just mentioned. Yeah, thank you. And it's a look. It's a it's a really important question, important point. We can't um, we we can't overstate the the mental health needs that exist for for young people for everyone in these contexts. Uh, and we are really fortunate, Grant Challenges Canada, to have be able to uh, support some uh, really important innovators who are working in some of these spaces. Kevin, I'm so glad that you got to see some of them yesterday. Yes, Teenergizer, if anyone doesn't know about it, is an amazing youth-led organization based in Ukraine that provide peer-to-peer um, uh, -peer counseling services for young people. Uh, and they're doing really, really amazing work right now and, and, and have been for some time and have adapted um, and responded to some really you know, horrible situations that uh, the young people they're supporting are in, but also that they themselves, as the young people leading this organization, are experiencing. Uh, in terms of some of the other contexts that are mentioned as well, yeah, it's it's incredibly important, and um, I know that there's a lot of work being done in those spaces. As as Babita said, they're definitely not forgotten, though I understand that it can feel that way at points. Grand Challenge of Canada, we also have a humanitarian Grand Challenge that's focused specifically on um, funding and supporting work in conflict and post-conflict settings, um, Afghanistan and Syria being being some of those. Uh, they fund not just in mental health, more broadly within health, as well as within some other sectors. Uh, and there's a lot of important work that's being done, but I completely agree that there's need for more um, and that there's there's always more that we can do to be able to address some of these concerns. There is always more. The mental health there community. is always more. Absolutely. And sadly, we are in a situation where, you know, the world and the way uh, global politics play out in some situations or displacement or, um, you know, it keeps coming. Um, and um, with that in mind, I'm just thinking about some of the mental health campaigns and works that have been done for the Uyghur community for the refugees that have been caught up in Cox's Bazaar in um, Bangladesh. So, you know, there is a lot of work going on, um, but the emphasis of course is to keep on going. Um, Svetlana said, uh, Tina and Jaisa is Ukrainian youth led NGO. They are truly great and supported by UNICEF. So thank you very much for that. Um, again, Charlene, we're talking about those lived voices, those lived experiences. And when I think about mental health initiatives, like you've all described, it is getting that voice out there that seems to resonate the most with people in terms of impact. Would you agree with that, Charlene? Absolutely. Uh, just from my experience, I would say even in, in the just the last couple of years, you've really seen, uh, you know, the, the recognition really growing more and more about the importance of lived experience at all levels, really. Um, you know, from uh, participating or being involved in policy, um, even service delivery, like Nicole mentioned, like the peer-to-peer -peer support. I think that is one such valuable uh, concept, mm. but yet it's not so much recognized in, in, in many countries, especially low and middle income countries, even in Africa, if I look. And if you think about it, uh, it's a valuable resource. In, in Africa, we often speak about the ratio between so many people needing mental health care and so little professionals. Here's a solution, it's peer support, peer support workers. A solution is right there, but it, it's like nobody's taking advantage of it. And there's just so many multiple benefits from that. Um, but lived experience, if you really think about it, it, it's us living with a mental health condition who really are affected by poor services, by stigma, by human rights violations, all those things. And who better to really uh, come up and, and help, you know, uh, kind of to contribute to solutions that will make a much bigger impact. Well, that's what really you focused on in the report is the solutions and understanding. I mean, those two words together, stigma and discrimination attached to mental health. I mean, we could not have been more obvious in terms of the challenges that are facing this sector. And I'm wondering from, you know, the findings of the report. And like I said, I, I urge anybody who hasn't yet done so, please do go ahead and read it because it's an incredible body of work. But for you, Charlene, I mean, what are the big takeaways from that for you in terms of exploring where we are at with stigma and discrimination here? I think what's, for me, what's so interesting is um, the one key message or, or kind of, you know, what came out of it is the power of people sharing their lived experiences, their journeys. 
I mean, it, it really makes such a, a difference in people's lives and really one of the most effective ways to really break down stigma. But of course, we also need to consider in terms of then stigma and discrimination, on the other hand, also may prevent people from sharing their stories and may create an unsafe space. So I think we need to really work on that and create a space where people are open to share their lived experiences because I think we can so much, I mean, I, I myself still learn so much from my fellow peers who share their stories, you know, so uh, let alone communities. I think COVID was also quite interesting for me. Uh, people who never used to speak about mental health all of a sudden spoke about the impact on their mental health. And I thought yeah. that was that really shed some light on onto the whole uh, mental health issue. Do you know, I was thinking about this, talking to um, other peers that I work with in the broadcast industry and globally, talking about how it was a type of leveler almost, um, although of course going through COVID was very different for so many people, depending on which country you're in. But that moment of isolation to really explore how you are and how you feel and sit with yourself is not an opportunity that many people get to do very often. And I think out of that, um, has really, I hope, and I don't know if you agree with this, but contributed to a, a better conversation on mental health. Um, Kevin, you're nodding. Would you agree with that? I would, you know, and I, 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 I think it's a great framing as well, Babita, because the thing that we're learning, because we're new here, so I'm, I'm the new guy on the field trying to figure this out and listening to thought leaders. There's two things I would like to suggest that we think about is that you know, the, I love, Charlene, the, con, the continued conversation around the lived experience, which is that people's participation in their life is just as important as yours. And sometimes we don't know what those mean. Um, but what that also means is we need to open up the door a little wider. When we first started this program, there was a lot of you know, thought leadership that said, no, you can't do this. You have to start here. It has to be youth to youth. We've learned all that other stuff. And it's like, but we need to also make sure that our parents, our caring adults, our teachers, our coaches are involved so that there's a platform to do that. So that was important to us as a media organization to also invest in that to make sure it went forward. But the other piece of it is, is that we're finding through any number, whether it's the pandemic, uh, I, I think we can all clearly see that global climate change is going to create different type of weather patterns. They're gonna flood Indonesia or volcanoes or you know uh, the Florida that young people are dealing with that in ways that they've never had to deal with it before so that's still an obligation of the lived experience so I'm so appreciative of us being very broad in the thinking there because there are no right answers but getting everyone on the table to share to storytell is what I think is going to help. Yeah and I mean incredibly pleased that you've mentioned um climate crisis, because I think that is the space where we really do need to focus on as well, in terms of the mental health and the well-being for many people. I'm just thinking about the Pakistan floods and, and the devastation that that has caused as well, particularly among, again, young people, but also for parents and caregivers around the world. Um, the pressure uh, to live and survive it for some, but also to understand it if it hasn't yet come to one's doorstep, you know, how we navigate that as well. Um, Harun is asking, there are lots of activities uh, going on in the whole month and years. Uh, can we think about sharing experiences, challenges and learning from each other at any global conference? Oh, that's just popped away in person or virtual. So we're kind of talking about that, um, Harun, a little bit here about sharing the experiences and initiatives as well. But um, Nicole, just a thought from you, because I know in this space you've been active for some time. So, you know, that idea that we can be more um, more sharing or, you know, explaining that our initiatives don't need to be in silos. Yeah, absolutely. The last thing we want to do is be um, is be in silos. Mental health is already too small of a field that's kind of under resourced and underfunded. And the best thing we can do is just try and leverage all the work that we're doing together. So it is really important. And I think platforms like these are some of the you know incredibly valuable. And um, thank you to United for Global Mental Health for for carrying these out over the last few years because I think that it's been a really great space. Um, for these types of sharings. And I think that we need more of them. So Harun, absolutely. There are different global um, conferences or moments where, where things like this happen, um, but we could definitely do with more of them. Yeah. Uh, and we also recognize that there are challenges 
to having to shift in some ways to a virtual space um, due to COVID, but that also affords new opportunities for types of hybrid models where perhaps wouldn't be able to travel to go to certain things. But I could say, for instance, we have a, there's a global mental health research conference in May um, that uh, the National Institute of Mental Health in the US, as well as Grand Challenge of Canada and Welcome Trust work on. Um, there are opportunities like that. There's more that come up, um, but of course, uh, I think that we can, look to these kinds of spaces that United holds for us as well to share more. Yeah, we should just um, add to that, um, Nicole, just as you were just saying that the Global Mental Health Action Network, members there are invited to an annual members meeting. Uh, that happens every year, which brings together mental health community, everyone to discuss their experiences and challenges and come together to understand and address all of those issues collectively. So, you know, there are initiatives working uh, out there. So uh, please do look into that more about how Perhaps you can participate because we'd love to have your voice heard in this global conversation as well. Um, and Anum is um, sharing with us that um, an organization called Kindred is working on providing psychological support to flood relief workers and victims in Pakistan. So thank you very much for that. Um, there is a lot going out on out there, which is really great to see. But I think bringing it all together in a space where we can share and make some sort of constructive change is, is possibly one of the biggest challenges we face now. Um, Charlene, I know, you know, for you, when we think about where we've landed with this report, and then let's say what happens in the next few years, what's the, I don't want to say dream, because that sounds like it's far reaching, but what's the, um, what's on the wish list for it? Charlene, are you with us? Oh, I think we've got a slight break up in Charlene's line, but we'll try and reconnect with Charlene in a moment. But yeah, it, it is that sense of trying to get involved together, Kevin, to keep that momentum building and to sharing and then building something for change. And that's hard. It is. And, and again, I think, uh, you know, reach back, bring people with you. I, and I, I, I think, there, I mean, just meeting Sarah, um at, at, at um global it just helped us so much be able to just kind of set a a place to pivot from to to look to the future to look to the best practices to look to the different types of indices that were involved there there's so much more learning um for the layperson and the the other thing is is that we can i i believe my personal opinion is is that we can um over index in the analytics of this when we're talking to the general public and and that's hard and so we need to find common language that people can easily enter into and i think you know babita you do that so well and i think other uh, other you know leaders and journalism can do some some good work there as well so i appreciate that there's one thing i think i've learned in my role as trustee here is um break down the acronyms Let's just go straight. Let's just go for the straight conversation because I know, I know why they exist and I get that. But I think when you really want to bring people on, bo on board, it's about just having a real honest conversation, one with vulnerability and transparency to really hit home to people. Charlene, you're back. Hello. Welcome back. I think we had a slight break up in your line there from South Africa. But um, I was just asking the question in terms of a wish list about where we want this report to land and, and in the context of, you know, how we can all work together with so many different organizations and so many different initiatives, how they can all come together to really make a difference. So I'm just wondering in that context, when we look at the reports that are coming out and like the one you've incredibly worked on, where you want it to land? Yeah, I think uh, if we all need to take a collective and uh, active stance on zero tolerance approach uh, to stigma and discrimination, uh, but also to create an environment that respects human rights and, and people's dignity, uh, those who are living with mental health conditions. So for me, that's my dream in a nutshell. Perfectly put. Thank you very much for that. Um, there were so many questions coming through. I'm doing my very best to get through them all. Um, this one, and I'm I am going to open this to all three of you because I'm not going to single anybody out because I think you need to have this kind of lens on this question. Um, this is um, coming from, uh, I'll come back to the name on that. I've just slightly uh, got that lost. But from a sustainability lens, this question asks, what are some strategies to measure the impact of these projects and other important outcomes which can help to influence mental health policies? Would anybody like to share with that? 
Sure. I think that's a really important one um, because we want no one, we don't want to just be funding individual project level work that's really important but the goal is that these can then be sustainable and that they can lead to broader change and impact within a country including for instance influencing mental health policies the creation of them or the implementation of them so there's a number of different ways that we at grand challenges canada look at that um, our overall metrics that we look at are around lives saved and lives improved, but then within that we also do look at what are government engagements that are happening within different projects. Um, what does this look like? How do you see um, broader campaigns within communities as well, as well within countries and knowledge change? And I think those are some of the key things that you need to look at to be able to assess how work can be um, impacted within a broader sense in a country. Uh, and from, I mean, sustainability lens, it's always an important thing. And we, one of the things that we do at Grand Challenges Canada is we always want to say, like, this is something we need to think about as soon as work gets started. Don't wait until you can show that what you're doing is successful. Start thinking about sustainability right from the get-go. Start thinking about how you're going to bring the, all the right actors into it. And I think that that's the key piece is that you need to have, for the, any mental health work to be successful, you need to take a multi-stakeholder approach and bring those people along with you from the beginning, um, whether it be within government or communities, private sector, whatever it looks like, keep them with you through the, through the course of your work um, to better hopefully get you to a space where that continues. You're getting nods from your fellow panelists there and, and from me too, because I think that, and, and also if I can add to that diversity and inclusion as well, those conversations when we talk about sustainability and DNI have to start from the outset. It's not something that kind of happens later on. You've got to have that, um, the foundation in place to begin with before you can really make effective change, I think. That question, by the way, is from Gillian. Gillian, thank you very much for that. Um, just a reminder that the conversation after this webinar finishes continues in Circle. And Circle is a virtual networking space for um, global mental health action network members where you can meet and discuss issues in real time, share information and indeed about your work and promote what you're up to as well. Uh, we'd love to see you there and hear more about what you're up to and also the World Mental Health Day successes and of course your plans for 2023. You can sign up to Circle and activate your profile. Um, our team at United for Global Mental Health are going to repost that uh, link for the uh, Circle uh, member chat. So um, that's going to continue. Oh, it's just gone on live on your chat function. So um, if you're missing that link, just have a look at the messages in the chat function and you'll see it there. Conscious of time, I knew this would whiz by. I completely knew it would whiz by, but I'm just going to, if I can, just ask um, a final question, if I can, to all three of you. And this is really... Um, <laughs> I'm going to ask in a kind of, if we can wrap up in a tweet length answer, if you like. Um, but this is really, you know, if you were to complete the following sentence, building on the momentum of World Mental Health Day this year, we need to, what? What do we need to do, Charlene? Yes, I'll go with a, with a quick, powerful one. I think we need to strive towards creating a world where nobody has to defend their humanity. And that's by eliminate or ending stigma and discrimination. I need to write these all down because that, that was a perfect soundbite and tweet. And actually, I'm hoping that somebody's going to hashtag this on our GMHAN or UGMH for this or the MH um, webinar for all. <laughs> hashtag so we can add that. Charlene, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to repeat the question so that uh, Kevin has a reminder for you. I'm coming to you next. Building on the momentum of World Mental Health Day this year, we need to what? Well, um, we, we use a term help, help people create the futures they imagine, which is to take away the barriers that get in the way of letting everyone get to their human potential, similar to Charlene, but that's what I would say. Lovely. Thank you so much. Incredibly powerful. And Nicole, do you want me to repeat the sentence for you again? Or would you like to go for it? I think I can go for it, though. Those are two very hard things to follow up. Um, so I would just say I think what we need to do is just work across sectors um, to try and advance mental health and well-being. And that includes supporting and amplifying the voices of young people and people with lived experience. Um, be able to advance this work. 
Thank you. Thank you all very, very much for this conversation. I'm just going to add in one of my own, if I can, just a, just a final takeaway. Um, it doesn't have to necessarily be a tweet length answer to this, but, um, you know, we're talking about reflections of World Mental Health Day and what we really want to focus on moving forward. And of course, we've talked about all the initiatives that you're all involved in. But I'm wondering, you know, on a personal level, whether we're thinking in terms of, you know, with your hat on as a daughter or a wife or a sister or a mother, um, what would you really like the mental health community, the policymakers, the advocates to kind of really concentrate on moving forward in the next 12 months? Um, Nicole? It's a great question. I think we, as has come up, we COVID-19 pandemic has increased conversation and visibility on mental health issues. And now I really would love to see that action into increased financing and support for mental health at the government level. I think we need to follow up now with some, with some clear um, more financing and action. Thank you. Charlene. Yes, uh, for me, it would be uh, nothing no uh, planning or implementation or whatever should happen without lived experience uh, being involved actively, meaningfully and authentically. Put it that way. Thank you. And Kevin? Um, I, I am seeing a huge turn in corporations talking to their employees um, and really giving them the ability to be their whole selves. And that includes when they are having mental wellness issues, particularly, and the pandemic brought that to us. And so I hope that continues is to allow people to have that lived experience in corporations such they can go home and be their best healthy self with their families. Yeah, put the money up. Let's continue the conversation essentially. And let's all have a safe space where we can be ourselves and help each other as well. Um, Charlene, Kevin, Nicole, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure talking to you today. Thank you for taking time out to share with us the incredible work that you're up to. And I hope that we can touch base again and follow uh, the stories as they continue as well. And thank you to all of you uh, for joining us today for this Global Mental Health Action Network from United for Global Mental Health. Um, that does bring our session to a close, but just please do remember that the Global Mental Health Action Network's new community engagement platform Circle, as I said a little earlier, is continuing with this conversation with network members from around the world. So again, thank you to our panelists for joining us today. I'm Babita Sharma and it's been my pleasure to host this session for you and I'll see you again soon. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>